Andrew Hutchison. You're tuned to Local Bias. My guest today is mystery writer Hazel Dawkins. <laughs> Have you ever been introduced that way? No, I haven't, and I love it. Well, th that's what you are, though. You're a mystery writer. At least it's a mystery to me. Um, <laughs> And I, this is the third book of yours I've read, but you actually have four books out. Yes, yes. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about this one first. Mm -hmm. Eyes on the Past. And of course the conceit here is, is it's the same character, Dr. Yoko, who mm -hmm. is a vision, and what, what is she? She's an optometrist who specializes in optometric vision therapy, which is of great value for your overall health, your behavior, and your perception um, for youngsters and adults. In fact, I first, I think, had you on years ago to discuss that very topic. The, yes, because my, my first um, factual book, um, uh, The Suddenly Successful Student, is a brief overview of optometric vision therapy and the practice in the, uh, across the U.S. 20, 20 colleges offer postdoctoral training in it. And so it's becoming more common. Yes. Because there were a couple of practitioners in Western Massachusetts that you told me about yes. at the time. Yes. Liz Dr. Lizotte retired, which is very sad. Okay. <laughs> he was in East Hampton, and there's Dr. Ruggiero in Northampton. So you had taken that up basically as a research project to, because you, you're an editor slash writer, and or, no, or you had actually undergone vision yes, therapy. Yes, because I, I, I had, um, since I'd had surgery on my left eye, when I was about 10, it, everything was black from that eye. And that used to upset my father. It didn't bother me particularly. I didn't know any better. And then when in my 40s, uh, we were living in Pennsylvania, and somebody said I should go to see an optometrist. And he said, well, you're not blind in that eye. And I said, really? <laughs> How is it that it, I don't see? He said, well, your brain shut off the uh, input because it didn't match. You know, each eye sees two dimensionally and it fuses halfway back right. on the visual cortex to become three dimensional, to match the world. And, um, but the interesting thing now is that I went from having nothing in that eye I have, I'm legally blind, central vision, but I have really good peripheral vision, which is very valuable for when you're driving. It's a leading cause of auto accidents. Oh, that's great, because I have glaucoma, which as you probably know, is a loss of peripheral vision. Yeah, yeah. But it's under control. Good. Um, but that, good. so that kind of got you rolling, and then yes. all of a sudden you've had this, uh, like a, it's not your career writing these novels, but certainly it's an avocation. I mean, it's something that you've been doing and yeah. the character has developed, and other characters have come along. Yes. <laughs> and, but this is a radical departure in a lot of ways from the other stories. Yes, I, I think partly because um, Dr. Yoko is Japanese-American, and I have, over the years, um, especially when I was living in Michigan, I knew a lot of Japanese-Americans, a lot of Japanese who were sent for five years to work in Detroit in the auto industry. And so... Um, I re and I was asked at one point to if I would tutor the wives, and I said, I'm not a teacher. And they said, no, no, you have been observed, <laughs> and you speak clearly, and you're very pleasant. And so it was great fun because the wives had immaculate English. They'd never spoken it. So we would go to the library, get a library card. We would do driving lessons, uh, go shopping. It was great fun um, just for them, for the wives to exercise the language, you know. So, so I, I really met and had friends in the community who were both Japanese Americans and Japanese living in this country for five years. And so I made Dr. Yoko um, Japanese American and she's, although she's fictitious, the structure, SUNY College of Optometry is real and a lot of the people in the book are real. Right. So when I started researching um, the incarceration of uh, Japanese Americans during World War II, I was also struck by the fact that um, all of the Japanese Americans from Bainbridge Island, where I had also lived, um, had, had were able to stay together. Yes, and went to Manzanar, and so, and then one of my neighbors, um, Lauren, um, told me he had a book. Um, he thought it was a book of poetry written by one of the inmates in one of the ten camps. So I said, mm, okay, um, because by then I'd read, you know, a dozen books and borrowed right. and bought, etc. Then he called me and said, I found the book. May I bring it over? So I said, sure. 
and it was the original Ansel Adams book. Ansel Adams had been invited to spend several months in Manzanar documenting life in the camps. And he was a very gregarious person. He loved people. So his photographs were fantastic in the original book. Mm -hmm. And um, a variety of friends, Diana Roberts, um, Bill Baker at Baker Office Supply, Garrett Connolly, um, um, various other people uh, scanned and cropped the photographs. They're a copy of a copy of a copy, so they're mm -hmm. not the best. But it, it's uh, an interesting... Um, well, they're still powerful, view. and they're, yes, in, and they're in the book. I, mean, I know. If, I only chose 10, and he's got about 20. But to me, the most amazing one is the, the oldest person in Manzanar at that time was Nobutero Harry Sumida, a veteran of the Spanish-American War and one of the people in... So I just think that's such a fantastic photo, and... Um, as I say, they, they do come, this one, Garrett had the worst time. This was a double page spread. Right, and, and I don't know if our viewers can see this though, so right, it makes it a little I bit difficult. I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, so you're gonna have to buy the book. Yes, of course. <laughs> Those are Ansel Adams pictures, isn't it? And a mystery. It's like, does it get any better? Uh, <laughs> Thank you. But, so one what, what of the things that those about the, so it goes back in time, so that, that's hence the name, Eyes on the Past. Yes. But yes. think about the times that we're in now where we've had this level of intolerance, you know, immigrants are blamed for things when they're not, yeah. the, they're not the problem. Right. And just like we're pointing our, our, the administration, he who should not be named, is pointing his fingers at others and mm -hmm. blaming Say mm -hmm. that's their fault. It's their mm -hmm. fault. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, that's what happened with these Japanese who were yes. patriotic Americans, had fought for the country, had identified as Americans, mm -hmm. had, but because the attitudes were well, they look different than us. Yeah. They they must be all spies for Japan or something. Right. I mean, right. it, it, it was illegal. It was unconstitutional. What happened? Yes. Yes. And it happened, and it will happen again and again and again, because whenever yeah. we come up to times like this, it seems people are willing to give up their rights for a false sense of security. Mm -hmm. um, yes. So did that, did what was going on in our country at this time kind of influence you going in that direction? It did, actually. As I started to research it, you know, it was a vague idea in the back of my head. And the more I looked at various books, um, I thought, this just resonates with the times now. And I, I just couldn't resist, actually. It, it was very, um, in many ways, it was challenging and painful uh, because, as you say, that the times, the camps were just outrageous. And, and yet what they managed to do yes. is they civilized, like, in the mm -hmm. outskirts of the Mojave Desert and mm -hmm. were able to grow food mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. have, uh, I they mean, did have a, a sneaky, whole structure. They did a sneaky diversion right. <laughs> from one of the, uh, the water, the, the reason the Mojave Desert is there is because they diverted the water to go to LA. Oh. It had been orchards before. Seriously? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Um, I mean, I know they had diverted water and that was a big scandal, yeah, but I didn't yeah, know that that's. Yeah. Yes, it, it um, Classic, you know, corporate, right. um, well, it doesn't matter, just take it away from. But, and then, of course, all of the camps were in pretty desolate areas. Um, and even the president at the time said they're concentration camps. And unfortunate, but as you say, the spirit and the individualism and the activism within the camps, they really transformed them. So they really um, surpassed they went beyond what had been given to them, which was brilliant, just brilliant. So there was, there was hope that came out of it, out yeah. of the darkest times. Yes. And they forgave. They were treated so harshly and they forgave. Yeah. Most of the people who were eligible signed up to go and fight <clears throat> in World War II. And um, several said, well, um, if you give us our freedom, we will go and fight. And the, they were called uh, the no-nos because they argued with it and they were sent to uh, one of the camps and double security really treated. And it's very interesting now because the parents, the families who went through that, 
uh, felt doubly guilty because there was there's there's a cultural ethic in this group of people culturally if somebody tells them they did something wrong they feel guilty right <laughs> and the shame extends to all members yes, of the family. Yes, yes, exactly. So, um, and there, there's a saying from an earlier time, um, if you're the nail that sticks up, you'll be hammered down, so don't stick up. Which is the antithesis of American culture, which is, hey, look right. at me! Yes, <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah, so it, it was something that, um, it, it finally just uh, took over and I couldn't resist. So how much does a book write itself at a certain point? Yes, actually, it's interesting. My daughter said to me once, she's, somebody asked me um, where Zorn Zeising, the detective, where he grew up, and I said, hmm, I've forgotten. She said, well, just look at your notes. And I said, what notes? <laughs> right. I don't, I, well, my notes are very scattered, but it does tend, once you've established a certain foundation, it tends to take off, which is very nice. Yeah, so. So, and when you're coming up with characters, like Zoran. Now, is he based on a real person? Yes. Actually, two real people. One is, is Tony Shalhoub. In, yeah, uh, well, okay. Yeah, I could totally see that. In fact, when I read that, I'm going, oh, this is like a, such a monkish character. Yes, yes. Wow. But well, of course, his nickname is Monk. Um, yeah, that, that's, uh, that was a great show. I really enjoyed it. And um, I really should send a book to Tony Shalhoub and ask right. him to give me a review comment. Well, know. one of the things I liked about um, Monk, and, we, and I wanted to go too far off the topic, <coughs> but his character was actually not very sympathetic. He was self-centered, a bit of a jerk, and y yes, okay, so he's OCD and all these other things. Mm -hmm. But yeah. anyway. <laughs> he can't really help himself, you know. It's if, it's, if somebody has diabetes, it's not because they wanted to. I mean, they can do things to help right. reduce it, but um, yeah, it's... Uh, yes, it's Zoran Zeising, um, and the name comes from two friends. One is, uh, her son is Zoran, and then I have another. So I, I have difficulty creating names, so... Um, really? Yes. See, I, I, I don't do much writing because I'm far too lazy. <laughs> But when I do, I love creating names. Huh, I should call you. You should call me. I, I can come up with a dozen names in, a, in, a, Excellent. in a 10 minutes, probably. Oh, I, it takes me forever, but... Um, I mean, there's always some kind of illusion behind a name. I mean, mm -hmm. there's, there's there, you know, you want the name to... That's a chance to have some kind of hidden meaning. Yes. You know, yes. what is in a name? There's a lot. So it's kind of fun. Did you notice Thomas Hardy? <laughs> well, I'm not real familiar with Thomas Hardy. <laughs> That's not, I've, I haven't read Hardy, so. Oh, really? Okay, well, um, I grew up close to Hardy country, so, and, you know, the, um, there are certain, um, going to school in England, there are certain uh, writers you absolutely have to read. Shakespeare, of course, is sure. one. and Jane Austen. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, but <laughs> yeah. well my sister was all about Austin, Jane Austen, mm -hmm. so. Yes, yes. I was never that fond of her, but I know that'll cause repercussions, but uh, sorry. <laughs> she's, well, you know, that's she's great. Now, now we're going to get a lot of hits when we put this on YouTube. Uh -oh. This is the woman that said that Jane Austen wasn't that great. <laughs> no, no, I said I was not that. <laughs> <laughs> she's a fabulous writer, but um, um, I guess I always go for the a little more um, obvious. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And, and when, you're, when you're writing, so you do, a, obviously you did a ton of research. Oh, yeah. I mean. Yeah, that's why it took so long. Okay, so this took longer than normal. Yeah, absolutely, yes. So, so the research is telling you all the backstory so that you, when you're writing, you're, you're writing from a place of knowledge. But then there's the plotting. Exactly, yeah. This is a kind of a convoluted, I mean, I know that they're supposed to be convoluted, but it was a surpri surprising plot twist, I gotta tell you. So when you're plotting things out, do you plot it out, it's like, okay, this is how we, this is what happens, and this is how we, this is how it happened, this is how we figure out that it happened. I mean, how much of that do you plot out before you start writing, and how much of it occurs to you? You have a general sense. I mean, obviously, there's a, something bad happened. So, is it different every time? Yes, yes. And really, <clears throat> as you said before, the characters really do drive the story. Um, I Part of the difficult, the reason it was slower than the others was, I had to try to separate the information. I didn't want to uh, drive people crazy with boring factoids, right. even though there's plenty of factoids in the book. But um, 
the twists came really because of the characters. Um, and I was almost as surprised <laughs> as anybody else when, it, when um, Thomas Hardy and his wife, when they showed their true colors. Um, and the friend who did the cover, um, and I love the color. Uh, Mark Aller, he's a brilliant graphic artist, brilliant. And uh, we tussled over the, um, over the title, and he was quite annoyed with me. He wanted eyes to the past, <coughs> which, and that, that's a very good twist, um, but I've been bitten before. Eyewitness was eyewit, and people didn't know eyewit is police jargon for eyewitness. Right. <coughs> Excuse me, so we retitled the book, uh, so it's Eyewitness, the second book. But, um, so, but Mark is a brilliant designer, you know, uh, and he very kindly, he said, whatever you want, um, I'll do it, which is very generous. He's in Pennsylvania, so... Um, well, I, yeah. I just think what, what I like about this is that it's very, it pops out. It's not one of these little demure books that, <laughs> that doesn't catch your eye. And the first thing you have to do is catch someone's eye. Yes, yes. And of course, you have to sell the books on let's say Amazon, mm -hmm. and I don't know how I don't use Amazon myself, but mm -hmm. my, I know my sister sells books on Amazon. Yes. So there's a whole yes. there's like algorithms to get people to be I aware know. of your book. I you have know. to get people to review it, or you give some away, or mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. all of those. Yes. So yeah. that's a whole different job from writing. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> not my most favorite part, and I'm always hoping to meet a math genius um, who will know how to work the algorithms because... Well, uh, they changed them up. Oh, really? Oh, see, you're yeah. ahead of me, yes. Well, yes. From, from what my sister tells me, yes. she, her book will be doing great. It'll be a, in a particular category. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden they'll decide, well, it doesn't really fit in that category. <gasps> oh. And they'll move it somewhere else where it doesn't get the eyes oh. on it. And, oh. But so when it's good, it's very good. Uh -huh. I mean, she made more in one month selling books that, than she makes in a whole year teaching. Oh, wow. Oh, I'm, well, I'm very glad that she, the books did that, but that's dreadful about the teaching. Well, she's an adjunct, so yes, she yes, doesn't make yes, enough. Yes. And, and teachers yeah. generally don't make no, enough for, don't. for what they do. No, um, no. God bless them, I'll each see. and every one. <laughs> um, but so, but your, your actual career is as an editor for other people? Yes, yes. I, I, it's much easier than writing. Um, it's wonderful. People come to me. Um, I don't advertise, but it's usually word of mouth and people come. Um, usually they understand that um, I'm going to look at the text and offer any suggestions. And sometimes I also um, help produce the book. Um, I've had, I had one client come to me and she said, uh, she's in Chicago and she said, I'm going to form a publishing company, but I know I need a professional editor. So, okay. <laughs> and she has done brilliantly. Um, I edited two of the books, the, the fir her first two books. I think she's writing a third, but she also has a full-time job. She has a son in college. You know, so right. it's like everything else. It comes when it uh, when she has a, a spare moment. But um, I've been very uh, appreciative of that one of the books that I had. Um, it was a romance, a trilogy, and the first book that came. I'd never worked on that genre before, and I called uh, Carol Letson, who was the director of the GCC Library. And I said, "What is the genre when they're all very wealthy? They have jet planes. They own Arizona, and uh, there's a lot of sex." And she said, "Oh, it's a ripped bodice." I said, "Really?" <laughs> so she, the, the storyline was fantastic, but it needed substantive editing. So I did the first 10 pages and said, this is what I would do if you're willing. And she said, yes, please. Okay. <laughs> so um, I'm hoping it's selling very, very well because uh, the author had to use a pseudonym. Uh, she teaches, and right. so, she, so she couldn't, um, she spoke to the union, and they said, mm, use a pseudonym. So she wasn't, a, I said, well, maybe, you know, a wig and glasses you could, but she hasn't been able to go out and publicize it, but oh, I right, think. Right, because that's one of the chief ways you get people to know, know about your books. I know, yeah, yeah. So, but it's, it's going very well, and there's a, there's a new bookstore in 
LA devoted to the rip, and it's called the ripped bodice. Oh, nice. <laughs> so I'm hoping that they will carry it. Well, I mean, her. traditionally, those have sold very well. The, the, absolutely. I mean, the, the, is our Harlequin romances fall in with that category? Mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm, I used absolutely. to be dismissive of them, but if I you know. want to make money. I know, I know. My, my The designer, who is brilliant, turned out she had written 10 romance novels. <laughs> and there's something, there's a formula, you follow it. I thought, oh, maybe I could write one after two pages. No, actually, I can't. <laughs> so you have to have a calling to do that. Yes. But to, even to be a writer, I mean, for instance, um, I was telling you about my friend Alan Steele, who's a science fiction writer. Yes, well, every yes. day he gets up at the same time, mm. and he spends a certain amount of time writing, and then he does... He does this, has breakfast, or something, then he goes back to writing, then he does this, and he does research. I mean, mm -hmm. his, he works an eight to ten hour day every yes. day as a writer. Yes, yes. And that's where I know that I'm not a writer because I don't write, even though in my head I've always gone, oh, I'd, I'd love to be a writer. Who wouldn't mm -hmm. love to be a writer? But mm -hmm. <laughs> there's that work element that yes. is just drudgery. It is, absolutely. Painful at times. So yeah. do you force yourself, it's like, I don't know what I'm going to, I don't know where I'm going with this, and you just sit down and you just stare at a blank piece of paper or at a computer screen? No, or, no, I write, I you write. You just write. Yeah, yeah. Uh, th there's a certain amount of research, as you said, um, but I do write, and, and then, of course, some of it gets um, thrown out, uh, which is great. The computer's so good for that. Right. But it, it is, it's 24-7, unfortunately. Because it's you in know. your head, too. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. See, I do a lot of video editing, and mm -hmm. what I think the key to being a good at video editor, and of course I'm editing a lot of stuff that I've shot or written, so I do write scripts, I suppose, but that's, yes. that's minor. Um, but you have to be ruthless about cutting what doesn't support the story. Yes. And that mm -hmm. means you can't be a tech, oh, I love that, and it's like, it doesn't matter, it doesn't help the story. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, have you cut anything that you really loved that yes. you wish you could find a way to, or maybe you, um, I love this part, but it doesn't belong here, but I'm going to hold on to it. Maybe it'll show You're up You're absolutely later. right, yes, yes. There, there are little squibs, I think, maybe, and of course they go back over every book and they've never been used. Um, I, I just like them so much, um, but uh, you don't want to turn the reader off. Right. You know? Yeah. Well, so, yeah. so when I watch DVDs of my favorite TV shows, I love it when they have deleted scenes. Yes, and, exactly. And they're generally right not to show that scene. I mean, they only have so much time, mm -hmm. and maybe it's redundant. Or something, mm -hmm. But still, it's just that much more. So if you're really into it, so maybe... Uh, maybe put the squibs in the back. Maybe put the squibs in the back, or, <laughs> or a set of short stories. Or, well, you know I have recipes also. <laughs> well, you actually, I was going to bring that up. One of the ways that you uh, kind of show the Japanese culture is you really kind of have the food. Yeah, mm -hmm. which is delicious, which I think. Which is delicious, but yeah. also not just the food, but the whole setting. Yes, well, it's interesting you say that because when my brother and his partner visited um, me when I was living in Michigan, we took them to a Japanese restaurant, and several years later he said, oh God, that, I didn't know what I was eating. <laughs> He's a meat and potatoes person. Oh, right. What can I tell you? It was very funny, but um, it was uh, an interesting illustration. I, I think that um, all food should be at least tested and tasted and preferably enjoyed. So is there any particular, uh, any particular Japanese dishes that you really like? Oh, shabu shabu. So what is that? Um, there's a large dish in the middle of the table, it, like an electric frying pan, if you will. And um, there's a lot of chopped up vegetables and some sliced beef. And you put the vegetables in and then uh, you put the beef in when you want. And you then scoop out broth and vegetables and beef. And the nice thing is that you can have it, you can have the beef nearly done, rare, well done. Um, to your own taste. And it's, yes, and there are restaurants specifically shabu shabu. And you can do it at home, of course, with an right. electric uh, fry, but it's really delicious. It's, if you like veggies, if you like meat, you know, so I guess I should have tried that for John too. <laughs> so something that you might be interested in because of your interest in Japanese culture are, are sake cups. Sake yes, wear. Yes. There's a teacher yes. at Greenfield High School, Lucien Kuntz, who makes sake wear. Really? And he gave a presentation at an art gallery in South Boston maybe four or five years ago, and the Japanese ambassador was there, and a, a Japanese master sake cup maker was there, and of course they had sake, which we were t tasting, and 
I have a couple of his cups, and I, when I was a teacher, I had a free period, I would go into his classroom, and I, he taught me how to make sake cups. I mean, mine are rudimentary, um, oh, that's, but, that's but still, it's, yes. it, I love it, something like that that's been handed down over centuries, mm -hmm. and honed and crafted, mm -hmm. yet there's still, so even though you're taught a certain way, this is how it's done, in the end, you have to come up with your own style. Yes, yes, and yeah, that's it, lovely. It, it, it is, it's, it's, a, it's fond memories. And, and actually, I drink sake, so I, I use them all the time. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm, that's plum wine, is it, sake? Well, no, 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 no it's no, rice wine. Rice wine, that's right. right, that's right, yes. The plum wine is Slivovitz, that's uh, Polish, I think. Uh, well, plum, there is Japanese plum wine. Ah, yes, yes. But I don't yes. like that at all. It's, too cloying to me. Too, yes, too sweet, yeah. yes. No, the, the sake is delicious. And, yeah. and, and I, I know we're digressing, but we, my, Kara and I went to a wine tasting in Hadley at the Senior Center um, to raise money for the Senior Center in Hadley. And the, well, that's a nice They had 46 bottles of wine to taste. Um, Who was the designated driver? Well, I didn't taste 46, <laughs> and I don't think Kara did either. But the, so the, we go to the first table, and they hand us the glass of wine. They pour it, you know, it's like two drops. I'm going, what? okay, whatever. I drink it. Oh, that's great. But after seven or eight, right. I'm, I was thankful they weren't giving me more than that because yes, I was yes, already yes. kind of loopy. Yes, yes. But, yeah, um, no. And that digresses. But the thing is, is that every, every winemaking region has their own culture behind those grapes, those varietals, the, mm -hmm. how they process it, who mm -hmm. does, who does mm -hmm. the work, the stories mm -hmm. behind it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So and the, the sake, the food, and yeah. it's for instance, you know, the Korean culture and what what uh, bibimbap means to them, or or kimchi even. Mm, um, I mean, yes, it's just yes. you you can. So what a great talk about a great assignment is to just explore the food. Yeah, and I yes. that's one thing that comes through in all your books is that you always take time out for a meal. <laughs> it seems, like, and some people have complained about that. Actually, one of my cousins said, why do you have the food in the book? And, well, people eat, don't they? I mean, it seems to me it's a reasonable thing, but... Well, it's in, it's, isn't it intrinsic to who we are in so many ways? I mean, doesn't that tell more about who we are, what we eat, and our attitudes? I agree, I agree. So I'm, yes. I'm happy you have the food in there. Thank you. And that was the only, I, the only time anybody had ever complained about food in the books. So Actually, you remember the book, Like Water for Chocolate? Yes. So, I mean, yes. you can do a lot with food in a book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, this is being sold, Eyes on the Past, is, it's on, if someone wants to find it, where do they find it? Well, it's at World Eye Bookshop. Well, it's okay. at um, um, Boswell Books. Okay. And, of course, it's on Amazon, and you can always... So, uh, how do you make the most money? I mean, that is, if someone buys it on Amazon, you get a cut? Or yes, I do. Yes, yes. But you get a better cut if it's from a local bookstore? Um, no, it's the same difference. Actually. But they should go to the local bookstore anyway, because Absolutely, this is local bias. Absolutely, yes, yes. Go to a local bookstore. And our bookstores are fabulous. Actually, it's a bookshop. Oh, Jessica bookshop. likes it to be called World Eye Bookshop. Okay. Well, I'll <laughs> stop in there and, and let her know that you corrected me. But I also have to uh, let it, that, you know, we've run out of time. Oh, Already. Okay. It flies by. <laughs> um, but Eyes on the Past, the author is Hazel Dawkins. Go to World Eye Bookshop or Boswell Books or Amazon if you can't get off the couch. Or stop Hazel stop on the Hazel, street. Stop Hazel, on the street. She'll carry one for you. Take her out to lunch. <laughs> I'm Drew Hutchison. You've been tuned to Local Bias. Thank you for joining us. Take care. Thank you.